just for my own kind of knowledge here, how many of you have heard the name Christopher Hitchens? Well, a lot of you, thank you. Well, that's good. Well, it makes my job easier because he died a few years ago. But Christopher Hitchens was not only the best known atheist in America, he was really the best known atheist in the English speaking world and even beyond. And I had uh, the uh, whatever uh, to, to hear him <laughs> several times. In fact, his book uh, that he wrote is like the Bible for the atheists called God is Not Good. And yet, I can tell you this, often, every time I probably heard him, I found him that he shames Christians for the lack of commitment to their own faith. In an article that was published uh, in Portland Monthly on January 17, 2009, Hitchens was interviewed by a mainline denomination, progressive, liberal, or whatever the title is, named Marilyn Sewell. Now, I want you to listen very carefully to how this interview went, okay? Sewell, the religion you cite in your book, generally the fundamentalist faith of various kind. I'm a liberal Christian, and I don't take the stories of the scriptures Literally. For example, I don't believe in the doctrine of atonement that Jesus died for our sins. Do you make a distinction between fundamental and liberal religions? (laughs) I want you to listen to what the atheist said, okay? Because that is going to pull you out of your seat as it did to me. Listen to what the atheist answered to that. It's astounding. In fact, it's going to make you agree with the atheist more than the so-called progressive, liberal, ordained, or whatever. Here's what he said. I would say that if you do not believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, the Messiah, who rose from the dead, and that by his sacrifice our sins are forgiven... You are not in any meaningful sense a Christian. (laughs) I tell you, I sometimes find that the enemies of Christ are far less confused about who Christ is than some people in the churches. That the enemies of Christ know the truth about Christ far better than many of those who are sitting in pews. Uh, The enemies of Christ understand the message of Christ far better than some who claim to be religious. I have no doubt that there's somebody probably at the sound of my voice, and by the way, we are watched by millions of people around the world on Kingdom Sat and online and uh, uh, social media. And maybe somebody here will say, Michael, that that doesn't make sense. How can you say that? Well, I just gave you an example. (laughs) But then I want you to ask yourself, not me asking, but you ask yourself these questions. Why would anyone absolutely, militantly forbid the mention of Jesus' name in public unless they fear the power of Jesus? Right? Uh, Why would anyone zealously go about removing the crosses from public eye unless they believe that there is power in the cross of Christ? Why would anyone forcefully persecute Christians or fire them from their jobs because they are committed Bible-believing Christians unless they fear the power of Christ in these Bible-believing Christians? The list goes on, but I won't take too much of your time on this. Every day, I hear stories from all over the Western world. Now, and I work with folks in other countries that I know the persecution, uh, and I have sat with them, I cried with them, I, I know the depth of persecution they receive, not only from the governments, but also from their own family. I know that, but I'm talking about persecution in the West 
from England to Australia, from Canada to the United States and all over the traditionally, supposedly uh, Christian lands. In fact, a friend of mine in Scotland, uh, he, he's probably watching us now, he watches every Sunday live, and, and, and he's been in a prominent position for 20 years, summarily was fired by the board. His guilt is he goes to a church that believes in biblical marriage. And that goes on. That the stories goes on all the time because I just happen to be in, 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 in contact with these folks and uh, ahead of a very prominent uh, sports club and well-known sports club in Melbourne, Australia. Lost his job. Same reason. Why is that happening now with vengeance in lands that are supposed to be Christian lands or had Christian history? I have one theory and that is as it was in the beginning in the first century, the first church is going to be in the last church. And we may be the last church before the return of Christ. As it was in the beginning is going to be at the end. Now, we started this way, going to end this way. But that's my own theory. It's not in the Bible. You can't find it in the Bible, so blame me. But these religious leaders... In the first century AD, the first century Christianity, these religious leaders, they crucified Christ. But after they crucified him, they went to this atheist Italian governor by the name of Pontius Pilate, and they wanted his help. <laughs> Imagine they're called religious people, wanted to the, 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 the atheist, the pagan, to get his help. What did they want? They want to stop the resurrection. They got him to descend him to death, but then now that's not enough. They want to stop the resurrection. Why? Because they feared the power of the resurrection. They said, please seal the tomb of Christ and then place guards 24 seven around the tomb. Now I want you to think with me, okay? I, I, I love it when you think with me. I, I, I don't want to do your thinking for you, but just think with me. These religious fanatics, and by the way, we have religious fanatics all over the United States, all, all over the world now. They're religious fanatics. They have their own religion, whether they were self-worship religion or nature worship religion or whatever it is. They are religious fanatics today. They wanted to crucify Christ. They crucified Christ. They saw him being crucified. They saw him die on that cross. They saw him buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. You would think that they accomplished what they wanted. Now they get on with their happy, merry way, but no. They want to stop the resurrection. I'm going to show you some ironies here that I pray to God, whether you're a believer or a pre-believer, I hope that everyone here, if it's not a believer, is a pre-believer because by the end of this message, I want you to become a believer. God wants you to become a believer. I mean, these religious leaders want to stop the resurrection. His disciples who walked with him and lived with him for over three years, they cut and ran. But no, not these folks. Not these shrewd fanatics, religious fanatics who hated the truth. Now get this, get this, please. They believed Jesus' teaching about his resurrection more than the disciples did. <laughs> Think about this. They believed Jesus promised to conquer death more than the disciples did. They trusted his promises that he will rise again on the third day more than the disciples did. Can you see how incredible this is? Can you see how incredible, how ludicrous this is? So they took the unprecedented step and went to Pontius Pilate, the, 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 the Roman governor, and they asked him, please seal the tomb. <laughs> For good measure... Put full-time guards 24-7. Now, <laughs> if you want to follow me, please, the Bible reading for today, I'm going to 
focus particularly on two verses. That's Matthew 27, uh, verses 62 and 63. And I'm going to come back to the other part. But here's what, uh, verse 62 of Matthew 27. The next day, after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Verse 63. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was alive, they know he's dead, that while he was alive, this deceiver said he will rise again on the third day. <laughs> they believed him. Can you see this? Can you see it? Can you see it? The non-believers in Jesus believed Jesus' promise more than his frightened disciples were hiding behind closed doors, shivering in their sandals. I, sometimes I kind of have sanctified imagination and I wonder in my own mind what this Italian pagan governor was thinking. <laughs> Put God 24-7 on, on a dead body in, in a tomb? Remember this, remember this. Back then, there were grave robbers. Yes, there were grave robbers, but they targeted rich, dead people because they got buried with their goodies with them. In fact, I, I even remember back in the 60s and 70s, some of you will remember, I'm not the only old one here, some of you old one, you remember, in the 60s and 70s, so many of these celebrities and movie stars, they want to be buried with their stuff. I remember one time that, 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 in, in, in California, they actually, one want to be buried in his Cadillac. And they did dig a big hole and put him down with his Cadillac. Others with money and gold and stuff like that. Yes, in fact, in ancient Egyptians, they were stole, they were going to dig, the robbers were going to pharaohs because the pharaohs had gold buried with them. But Jesus, he was homeless. He had nowhere to lay his head at night. Please, please, please focus with me here on how the enemies of Christ believed Christ. They feared the resurrection. They feared the power of the resurrection. How the enemies of Christ remember well, they remembered very well the promise of Jesus that on the third day he will rise again. Like Christopher Hitchens, the atheist, he understood the gospel of Christ better than the so-called ordained person. They said, he promised to rise again. So help us to stop the resurrection. Help us to stop the resurrection. Yeah, best of luck on that one. <laughs> what would the Roman governor do? in the face of this apparent insanity. Well, he went ahead. He said, okay, we seal the tomb and we place guards. And now just as the ancient hymn says, vainly they watched his bed, Jesus my savior. Vainly they sealed the tomb, Jesus my Lord. Oh, my friends, I'll tell you, the Bible is not an amusing book. It really isn't. The Bible deals with deadly issues, issues of life and death. For example, the most important question in the Bible, the answer is, where would you spend eternity? And the Bible persisted until each one of us answered that question. These are deadly serious questions, but the Bible also an honest book. <laughs> where the Bible, when, when the Bible reports some situations in life, Sometimes they appear to be funny and amusing. Oh, how many times I'm reading the scripture in the early hours in the morning and I chuckle. Sometimes if my wife is up by that, by that time, she would say, what are you chuckling about? I said, it was just something very amusing. This is one of them. <laughs> They're trying to stop the resurrection. Because the Bible reflects this situation honestly without embellishing them, without modifying them. They can be amusing at times. These religious fanatics, these religious leaders who hated Jesus, they believed what Jesus said. Are you with me? That he promised to rise again on the third day while the disciples 
went back in the upper room and locked the door. They were terrified. Listen, I know sometimes I speculate, and, and I tell you that ahead of time so you, you don't go and look for it in the Bible. I, I think Pontius Pilate was laughing at these religious zealots. Or probably did it in order to mock their paranoia. <laughs> you guard a dead man's body. Ah, beloved, listen to me. This should encourage every one of us. Listen to me. It should encourage every one of us to look with pity and sympathy upon those who reject Christ as the only Savior. For those who reject God's only one plan of salvation. For those who reject or mock the cross and the power of the cross. For those who hate Bible-believing Christians and those who persecute Bible-believing Christians. Why am I saying this? Because they are terrified of the power of the resurrection. The very thing that they, the, the very thing that, that lifts us up above our circumstances and upon our difficulties and above all the bad news that we hear every single day, the very thing that empowers us makes him fear. The very thing that comforts us, they hate. The very power for living, they resent. But don't miss this, don't miss this. The haters of Jesus did not fear their disciples. No, 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 no. That motley crew, the, the, the bunch of fishermen, they did not fear them at all. They saw them actually with their eyes running like jackrabbits in the Garden of Gethsemane. Ah, but they feared the resurrection. They feared the resurrection. And that's exactly what today's deniers of the resurrection of Jesus fear. They fear the resurrection. Nothing changed. Human nature has not changed. Those religious enemies of Christ saw Jesus heal the sick. They saw Jesus open the blind eyes. They saw Jesus make the deaf hear and the lame walk. They saw Jesus touch and cleanse lepers of their diseases. They saw Jesus raise the dead. And they could not doubt his promise that he will rise again on the third day. So they're trying to stop the resurrection. As atheist Hitchens said, if you do not believe in the resurrection, you are not in any meaningful sense a Christian. What a rebuke, huh? And so Pilate tried to humor them and sealed the tomb and put all red wax and stamped it with the emperor of Rome stamp. And, and then for good measure, they... He put guards. But as the eyewitness account tells us that there was an earthquake, angel from heaven came and he appeared like lightning and the stone rolled away. So much so that these big, barely Roman soldiers <laughs> were terrified and the, the Bible said they shook like being dead. The seal is broken. The tomb is empty. The gods are scattered. Christ is risen from the dead. Praise God. <laughs> you know, Job said, the thing I feared came upon me. This, what these religious leaders feared came upon them. As soon as the news of the resurrection reached every portals of Roman powers, they too tried for 300 years to stop the resurrection. But they did it differently. I'm gonna to come to that in a minute. But back in Jerusalem, what these religious fanatics, these religious, religious leaders do, what would they do? Well, they bribed the guard, you know, money speak, money, money what was it uh, t saying, you know, money talks. So they gave them a few denarii. Hey, go retire down in the Negev. We give you very generous severance pay. We're going to make it worth your while. But lie and say that his disciples came and stole the body. Huh? The disciples? 
<laughs> this terrified bunch of motley crew was hiding in the upper room. They came and stole the body. They were strong enough to stand against these big Roman soldiers. Listen to me. This is too fake news even for the New York Times. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> the disciples were hiding and shaking like leaves to overcome these powerful soldiers. It was and is always be a fake story and stinks like high heaven. Listen, when the disciples saw the resurrected Jesus, when they spent 40 more days walking and talking and eating and fellowshipping with the resurrected Jesus, they were empowered, they were emboldened. Every one of them gladly die for the resurrected Jesus. You don't die for a hoax, do you? They could not keep quiet about the great news of the resurrection. What these religious leaders do, now that they couldn't stop the resurrection, how are they going to stop these guys? How are they going to keep them, keep their mouth shut from testifying to the resurrection and the resurrected Jesus? Because every time they tried to kill one of them, they multiplied like rabbits. Here's one of the ironies. There are a lot of ironies here. I could take forever telling you about one of the ironies. Among those religious fanatics, there was a distinguished young rabbi who was there in that Sanhedrin, in that, in that council. In fact, he rose into prominence and fame by the intensity of his hate uh, for the, and the deadly zeal against the Christian believers who kept on proclaiming the resurrection. We say, you kill us, but we're not going to stop talking about the resurrection. We're not going to stop testifying to the resurrection. So when they could not stop the resurrection, what would they do now? Well, they intimidate, they imprison, and even eliminate the believers who saw the resurrected Lord. <laughs> this young rabbi was known for his ability to do some dreadful things, terrible things to the believers in the resurrected Jesus. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He was determined to stamp out Christians from the whole region, not just from uh, the land of Israel or Jerusalem, the, uh, Judea. No, no, he, wa he wanted to just stamp them out from the whole region. So he takes a arrest warrant from the high priest and he pursues those believers in the resurrection all the way to the city of Damascus in Syria. That's a long way. Listen to me, please. Now that he and his bosses failed to stop the resurrection, they wanted to kill everyone who had witnessed the resurrection. Little did they know, and little did Saul of Tarsus know, that he was kicking goads. You know what the goads are? The sharp uh, metal. Every time you kick against it, you bleed more. Every time you kick against it, you bleed more, and you bleed more. He was kicking against goads. Hear me right, please. Inside Saul of Tarsus, in his mind, there was an internal war going on. In fact, his outward resistance can only be explained by his inward struggle. Oh, my dear friend, please, please listen to me. Please listen carefully. Some of you, whether you are in this beautiful building or watching around the world, some of you now are fighting hard, trying to silence the voice of the resurrected Jesus, even as I'm speaking to you. Some of you here right now in, have internal wars inside of you, and you are refusing to submit to the authority of the resurrected Jesus. Some of you internally are trying to seal your mind from hearing the voice of the resurrected Jesus. Some of you are placing guards on your minds and on your heart and keeping Jesus from coming into your life with his resurrection power. You know, I say, look, some years ago, a neighbor of mine says, Michael, I've got all my mind made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. 
Oh, I'll tell you, I pray. I pray that on this Resurrection Sunday, not a single person at the sound of my voice, not one person who have never fully surrendered to the power of the resurrected Jesus would not come to him, surrendering to him, believing in him, receiving him into your life. Just like Saul, the Tarsus, you will never be the same. You will never be the same. I'll make you a promise. You'll never be the same. I'll never be the same. Like Saul of Tarsus, when they failed to stomp the witnesses of the resurrection, when they failed to silence the voice of the resurrected Jesus, you might be able to try at least for temporary to stop that voice, to drain that voice, to drown that voice, to, to overcome that voice, to override that voice. Oh, let me testify to you. Let me testify to you. 58 years ago, I have tried all of that. I've tried running away. I've tried to drown his voice. I've tried to dull his voice. I tried to appease his voice. I tried to rationalize his voice, but thank God he would not give up on me. And he will not give up on you. The very fact that you are here today is an indication that God has not given up on you, that he wants to speak to you. I know it's my prayer and the prayer of many, perhaps family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers have been praying for you. That same resurrected Jesus who called this young zealous rabbi who hated Christian believers, he called him and knocked him off his horse. Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. I'm Jesus whom you of persecuting. For the rest of his life, Paul talks about his testimony. He talks about that moment when he had an encounter with the risen Christ. He said, I'm not privileged like the other 12 who watched and saw the resurrected Jesus, but I equally am an apostle because I saw the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. You see, Saul of Tarsus wanted his religion to seal his heart from the resurrected Jesus. He wanted his heart to be fortified by his false religion, whatever it is, religious activities you're into. He tried to let his good deeds maybe silence that voice or muffle that voice of the resurrected Jesus, but he finally he had to submit. He had to surrender. And I'll pray the same for you today. Finally, he could not resist the voice of the resurrected Jesus anymore. Who are you, Lord? You can ask that same question. And you know what? The Lord will answer you. And you can do that today. You can do that today. Don't put it off because you can't guarantee tomorrow. Here's a fact that is testified to by thousands, oh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world. You will never find real peace of mind until you submit to the resurrected Jesus. You will never experience free, true freedom from sin and guilt and shame and addiction until you submit to the resurrected Jesus. You will never experience true meaning for life until you submit to the resurrected Jesus. You can never be assured of eternity in heaven unless you submit to the resurrected Jesus. And you can do that today. Finally, when Saul of Tarsus submitted to Jesus, Jesus not only changed his life, 
but he also changed his name to Paul, the great apostle. After Paul's conversion to Christ, many others have tried, many others have tried for 2,000 years, a lot of others have tried to seal their minds, seal their hearts from the resurrected Jesus, but they failed. In fact, they are all dead, but the resurrected Jesus is living today, speaking to every one of us in this moment. Emperor Nero, one of the most vicious men ever lived, who dipped the Christians in tar and let them lit his garden for his parties. That's how, how cruel he was. He used them as human torches. He failed, they prevailed. He could not stop the Lord. In 303 AD, Diocletian promised to stomp out the followers of the resurrected Jesus from the Roman Empire. He failed, they prevailed. He could not stop the Lord. In 361 to 363, Julian the Apostate tried to make it impossible for the believers in the resurrected Jesus to live in Rome. He failed, they prevailed. He could not stop the Lord. They could not seal the tomb. They could not guard the tomb to stop the resurrection. So they tried to kill the ones who testify, who have seen with their eyes the resurrected Jesus. Everyone except John died a martyr's death of these disciples. And gladly, gladly, because they knew this life is not worth a living unless Christ is in it. And therefore they were happy to go and be with Jesus. For everyone who was killed as a martyr for the resurrected Jesus. History says 10 others have risen to take their place. The despots and thousands of others who tried and could not seal the tomb because the tomb could not hold him, could not hold him. He is risen from the dead. He is risen from the dead. What about you? What about you? Are you trying to seal the tomb of your mind and of your heart with your own ideas of who God is or at least what he should be? A lot of people tell me, hey, God should do this. God, God is this. God is, they've got their ideas about God. No, no, no. There's only one way about God and it's his word. There's some who just self live for self and self pleasing. There are even some who worship self. Some want to do their own thing. Some want to control their life, but they can't. And they know they can't. You have seen the resurrected Jesus in the lives of your friends, of your family members. You've seen the life of the resurrected Jesus in your coworker and in your neighbors and people who love you, you have seen the resurrected Jesus in their lives. Oh, you must say, well, Michael, I'm not really hostile toward Jesus. I'm a church now, aren't I? <laughs> Please listen. I have great news for you today. That's the best news ever. And you may have heard it before and you silenced that voice again before. Please don't do that today. The very power that broke the seal and overwhelmed the guards is available to you today. The power of the resurrected Jesus is working in the life of every believer if we just grasp that. That's the promise of God in the word of God. I don't make this stuff up. I'm not that bright. The very voice that Saul heard nearly 2,000 years ago speaking to some of you today. Soul, soul. And I want you to replace that with your own name. Bob, Sue, Jane, Bill, Michael, John. Replace that with your own name. And hear the voice of the resurrected Jesus afresh today. 
Why are you kicking against the goats? It can only cause you more bleeding on the inside. Why are you trying to silence my voice? The Lord is saying to so many people today, why are you refusing my generous invitation? Why are you resisting the best thing that can happen to you? I died your death on the cross. I paid your eternal debt on that cross. Oh, but then I rose again. I rose again to assure everyone who surrendered to me of their own resurrection and presence with me in heaven. Lay down your defenses. Lay down your sword. Lay down your guards. Lay down your resistance. Come to me. Turn away from sin. This is the voice of the resurrected Jesus today on this Resurrection Sunday. For only his resurrection power can give you power for living and hope in death. Will you do that today? Will you do that today? Will you come to him? I'm going to ask us to bow our heads in the presence of a holy, righteous, resurrected Jesus. This is a very personal decision. I know it's between you and him. You've heard that voice, please harden not your heart. You might not have another chance to hear this message and respond to it again. Life is so uncertain. If you want to respond to him, say, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I thank you for persevering with me. I thank you for giving you one more chance to respond to your gracious invitation. I thank you for your grace and mercy that extended to me today. Help me not to harden my heart. God will answer that prayer. Then I can tell you at the end of the service, there'll be pastors, gifted pastors all over this in the front here and be willing to answer your questions, respond to your doubt. And they'll pray with you, encourage you along the way, give you some material to help you grow in your decision that you made for Christ. Father, I am so indebted to you. As I know thousands of people who are here watching and watching online and watching around the world on Kingdom Set, who are so grateful to you that you have not given up on them. Thank you, Father, for pursuing us. And I thank you for your long suffering, for your patience. And so I pray for everyone who has purposed in their heart today that they will be encouraged, that they will move on and grow in their walk with you. For only your Holy Spirit can do that. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray. All of God's people said, praise the Lord. Lord. Stand up and sing with us.